Namaskar and welcome to Diplomatic Dispatch, the show that tries to demystify diplomacy and make complex international issues understandable to everyone. I am your host, Vikas Swaroop. This week, we will tackle a subject that is of increasing importance worldwide and especially to India, maritime security. Maritime security means the protection of a state from threats arising from the oceans and seas. So it could include securing coastal areas, protecting the marine environment and available ocean resources such as fish, safeguarding offshore oil and gas wells and port facilities. It also means maintaining freedom at sea for movement of ships and facilitating and protecting trade. With a coastline of over 7,500 kilometers, including 1,200 islands, maritime security is critical for India. Our rich maritime history goes back to at least the third millennium BC, when the inhabitants of the Indus Valley civilization engaged in maritime trade with Mesopotamia. The archaeological remains of the world's first dock at Lothal in Gujarat bear testimony to India's prowess as a seafaring nation. Today, almost 90% of India's international trade is through maritime routes. Therefore, it is in our interest that the sea lanes are kept free for global commerce and as corridors for peace and mutual prosperity. With an aim to deepen economic and security cooperation with its maritime neighbors and assist in building their maritime security capabilities, Prime Minister Narendra Modi during his visit to Mauritius in 2015, put forward the Sagar Doctrine, an acronym for security and growth for all in the region. This vision focuses on cooperative measures for sustainable use of the oceans and provides a framework for a safe, secure and stable maritime domain in the region. This was followed by PM Modi's 2018 Shangri-La Dialogue speech in Singapore, where he outlined India's Indo-Pacific vision. And in 2019, he launched the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative at the East Asia Summit in Bangkok, focusing on seven pillars of maritime security, maritime ecology, maritime resources, capacity building and resource sharing, disaster risk reduction and management, science, technology and academic cooperation, and trade connectivity and maritime transport. More recently, on the 9th of August, 2021, as part of the activities of India's Presidency of the UN Security Council, Prime Minister Narendra Modi presided over the United Nations Security Council debate on enhancing maritime security, a case for international cooperation. In more ways than one, this was a historic first. The first time that an Indian Prime Minister chaired a meeting of the UN Security Council. It was also the first time that maritime security was discussed by the Security Council under the agenda item of international peace and security. In his remarks, Prime Minister Modi proposed five principles as a framework for international cooperation in maritime security. These included the need for removing barriers to legitimate maritime trade, resolving maritime disputes peacefully and in accordance with international law, jointly fighting maritime threats from natural disasters and non-state actors, conserving maritime environment and resources, and promoting responsible maritime connectivity. To mark the convening of this event by India, the Security Council adopted a presidential statement on maritime security, the first such UNSC outcome document on the subject, with the unanimous consent of all 15 member states. India has also made its mark as a net provider of security in the Indian Ocean region and beyond, including as a first responder for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. So clearly, India has become a major contributor to international maritime security and its evolving norms. Let me now introduce the two experts who will tell us more about this important issue. With me in the studio, is Admiral Robin Kumar Dhawan. He was the 22nd Chief of Naval Staff of the Indian Navy, serving from April 2014 to May 2016, having previously served 
as the Vice Chief of the Naval Staff from August 2011 to April 2014. He has served as Director General of the National Maritime Foundation and is currently the Chairman of the Society for Aerospace, Maritime and Defence Studies. And joining us via video link is Ms. Pratnashree Basu, an Associate Fellow at Observer Research Foundation, Kolkata, with the Strategic Studies and Maritime Initiative. She works on maritime geopolitics in the Indo-Pacific with a focus on the South China Sea. Let me begin with you, Ms. Basu. Why is the Indo-Pacific maritime space so important? Um, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, the Indo-Pacific maritime space um, has been important for millennia, actually. It is not just now that it has become important. What has become important is the narratives that surround this geographical space. So um, uh, because of maritime trade, which flourished in the past and which, uh, which has received a renewed uh, emphasis over the last few years, uh, the Indo-Pacific region has uh, been uh, receiving a lot of attention. It has, it has become a region of prominence, not only for countries that are within the region per se, but also countries that are far away from this, uh, from this geographical space. Um, and this has happened partly because of the rise of China. Uh, and the uncertainties and, and, and the ambiguities that have followed um, the, uh, China's footprints as it expands its uh, influence uh, around the world. And um, this is why we find that the littorals of the Indo-Pacific region, uh, countries like India, Japan, Australia, and so on, are all concerned. They, are, um, they, 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 would, they want to um, pose it a united um, front uh, to China, um, uh, and and basically this is not this is to uh, stand as uh, uh, a sort of a, a, to form not I do not want to use the word alliance, but to form a sort of platform to form different multilateral bilateral cooperation mechanisms that can better assess, better um, implement, and better understand uh, China's activities, and therefore act as a better response mechanism. Uh, we've also seen how uh, groupings, uh, how, how international uh, uh, groupings like the European Union, countries within it, and also as an organization um, as a whole, uh, they have also recently started um, uh, expressing their uh, interest in the Indo-Pacific region. And um, besides the rise of China, uh, another important factor is that this region, it, it is through this region that some of the world's busiest shipping routes pass. So it is important for countries that are uh, uh, as well, uh, countries not just within the region, but also across the world to secure these sea lines of communication and to ensure that trade is not disrupted. Trade flows, are, trade flows can move uh, seamlessly, smoothly, Indeed, a number of countries from the European Union downwards have come out with their own Indo-Pacific strategies. But Admiral Dhawan, I want to ask you about India's strategy. Now, the Indian Maritime Security Strategy, Ensuring Secure Seas, a document issued by the Indian Navy, characterizes maritime security as freedom from threats at or from the sea. So what are the threats and challenges that India faces from the sea, both traditional and non-traditional, and how has India responded to them? Thank you very much, Ambassador Vikas Saroop. It's indeed a privilege to be on your show. Uh, before we dive headlong into the traditional and the non-traditional threats in the maritime domain, I would like to explain to your viewers that India is essentially a maritime nation with a natural outlook towards the seas. And to understand the maritime perspective, we need to actually imagine the map of India and the surrounding Indian Ocean upside down. When we do that, we quickly lose our continental focus. And we realize that we in India actually should be looking outward towards the seas, which surrounds us from three, three sides. And we are heavily dependent on the seas for our trade, for our resources, for our prosper prosperity, as well as maritime security. As a maritime nation, India sits astride busy sea lines of communication over which 66% of the world's oil, 50% of the world's container traffic, and 33% of the world's cargo traffic transits every year. But the seas are no longer a benign medium, and globalization has resulted in vulnerability of the oceans. 
Our traditional threats in the maritime domain remain from our western neighbor, Pakistan, and the challenges that are posed by the enhanced deployment of the Chinese PLA Navy in the Indian Ocean. Now, the security umbrella for all our traditional threats and for our maritime interests is provided by the Indian Navy, which has emerged as a multi-dimensional networked force and was ready to take on any challenge in the Indian Ocean and beyond. The countering of these threats, whether it's traditional or non-traditional, is provided by the Indian Navy. But as far as the non-traditional threats are concerned, they are as wide and varied as they come. Mm -hmm. Who could have imagined that in the 21st century, we would once again be grappling with pirates? Yes. Or that the major threat in the maritime domain would be from asymmetric challenges and maritime terrorism. But that is a reality today. And the other challenges include arms trafficking, drug smuggling, human trafficking, and poaching, or illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Yes. So to meet these threats, the Indian Navy actually carries out their tasks and responsibilities under four basic roles. Under the military role, the Indian Navy is the manifestation of India's maritime power. And it maintains a very high operational tempo, keeps its skills honed, and is ready to take on any challenge or exigency or external threat to the sovereignty of India from the maritime domain. Under the constabulary role, we ensure coastal and maritime mm -hmm. security as well as offshore security. And this is where we take care of all the non-traditional threats by exclusive economic zone patrols, which we carry out in our own waters as well as the waters of our neighboring maritime countries. We also carry out anti-piracy patrols, such as the patrols in the Gulf of Aden. As far as the benign role is concerned, here we provide humanitarian assistance and disaster relief in the aftermath of tsunamis and cyclones. Because due to the detrimental impact of climate change on the oceans, the intensity and frequency of these natural disasters has increased. Mm -hmm. India also carries out roles such as non-combatant evacuation roles. And this was something like evacuation of Indian citizens in Aden in 2015 that the Navy had carried out. Finally, we have the diplomatic role. And this is where the Navy expands its operational footprint across the oceans and carries out interaction with navies of the world. This is also where, as part of the navies of the Quad countries, the Indian Navy interacts and ensures stability, peace, and security across the Indo-Pacific. Very comprehensive indeed. Now, Pratn Shri, your work explores the political and functional dimensions of a rules-based maritime order and maritime law and governance. So tell our viewers, what is the legal framework that regulates the world's oceans? Uh, so in the maritime domain, countries are guided by the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas. And um, uh, this has supporting mechanisms also like the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea and the Permanent Court of Arbitration, uh, which has jurisdiction uh, over any uh, maritime dispute that may arise. Uh, the negotiations and sort of final uh, agreement of the principles that are enshrined in the uh, UNCLOS um, uh, was a protracted process that covered many years. And, uh, the, and with, with the majority of countries uh, having been a party to this process. Uh, the ensuing framework that came into uh, and an and agreement that came into place uh, sought to establish uh, balance and equity in the governance of ma the maritime sphere with uh, defined rights and um, uh, for the exploration of uh, maritime resources. With uh, the basic understanding being that the ocean spaces were a common resource uh, available to all through a graduated system of rights, further seaward from the baseline by which I mean the shore, and the, 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 these rights become more diluted uh, in nature. Uh, now, despite uh, the inclusive nature of the unclos, however, um, there are uh, certain legal nuances that uh, can often become ambiguous. And this is where uh, the different interpretations that countries have pertaining to their maritime space, pertaining to how they are going to exercise their maritime rights come into play. 
Now, right. India believes that the settlement of maritime disputes must be peaceful and on the basis of international law. With this understanding and maturity, we resolved our maritime boundary with Bangladesh, for instance. But as you have yourself said, we have seen instances of some countries defying international law and even refusing to accept verdicts from neutral arbitration tribunals. So how do we proceed in such cases and how are countries in the region dealing with this? Uh, so what happened in the case of uh, the Philippines, uh, the court did rule in favor of the Philippines, but the country in question which against which Philippines brought the case was China, and China chose to disregard the verdict. What China said was in response to the verdict was that it had historical claims to the South China Sea region and no uh, no other uh, international mechanism, and in this case it was of course referring to the Permanent Court of Arbitration, had any right to comment on something or to pass a verdict on a region that it considered as its own backyard, it considered as, it, as part of its own sovereign territory. But this is where uh, understandings of international maritime law are in direct contravention to how China perceives um, its own um, uh, uh, maritime space, its own maritime actions, and its own maritime area of influence and jurisdiction. And uh, instances of infringement like the one that, uh, like the ones that we have seen in the case of China, are uh, are very dangerous precedents for the world order because in global institutions such as the UN and global mechanisms, global rules-based order uh, orders like uh, the UNCLOS and the Code of Conduct for the South China Sea, in particular, that is being worked out, these are mechanisms that are there for the eff effective governance of uh, uh, states in question, they are there, they are put in place for uh, so that seamless uh, interactions and seamless exchanges can happen between nation states. They are put in place so that there is a system of fairness and equity in how states interact with each other. And therefore, if these, if, if, in, in, if infringements such as these take place and if there is blatant disregard for uh, such institutional mechanisms, which countries have actually all agreed to, uh, to adhere to, to abide by, then that poses a very, um, uh, uh, a very dangerous precedent, and it poses a very uh, basic and a very fundamental question in that: How do we make these systems more effective? How do we put in place mechanisms that can deter such actions? Now, Admiral Dhawan, China has not only stepped up its naval activity in the South China Sea, but also in the Indian Ocean. So, how has China's growing presence in the ocean next to us? affected India's thinking on maritime issues? Well, this is a serious issue because uh, the Chinese PLA Navy is in a modernization mode and it is developing itself to be a major, major maritime power. The Chinese PLA Navy has been deploying the anti-piracy escort force in the Indian Ocean since 2008 regularly, without a break. This means that these are assets on the lines of frigates and destroyers, and at times, even submarines, even nuclear submarines, which form part of this anti-piracy escort force, and which shows China's presence in the Indian Ocean. The Indian Navy very closely monitors the movement and activities of all the PLA Navy assets by deploying what we call as our ISR, or the intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets. These include our long-range maritime patrol and reconnaissance aircraft, our surface assets, and space-based assets to monitor and the activities of the PLA Navy units as they take place. China indeed has displayed an aggressive posture, and the issues in the South China Sea range, as you are aware, from sovereignty, territorial integrity, freedom of navigation, and control of resources. Also, the issue which has taken place is that the instabilities and turbulence in some parts of the Indo-Pacific region has the potential to spill over into the maritime domain. Mm -hmm. And the situation can best be described as fragile. Consequently, over 120 warships from over 20 navies are always deployed in the Indian Ocean region to safeguard their maritime interests. India has advocated adherence to international law and maintenance and promoting of peace and security, maritime safety and security, freedom of navigation, and overflight in the region. Now, Pratna Shri, the Quad, which brings together India, the United States, Australia, and Japan, 
stands for a rules-based international order and for a free, open, transparent, inclusive and prosperous Indo-Pacific. What can the Quad do to enforce a rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific? Um, the Quad has undertaken a lot of, uh, a, a number of initiatives uh, ranging from uh, vaccine diplomacy to maritime security. They cover a range of issues. But, uh, and, and, and I think the most important thing that it is doing in terms of maritime security is to strengthen the partnerships that are there within the four member countries. Uh, for the establishment of a rules-based order or to strengthen the existing rules-based system that is already in place, uh, I think the Quad is already doing what it can in terms of, as I mentioned, strengthening the partnerships between the countries, putting in place mechanisms that would um, uh, uh, sort of strengthen not only uh, bilateral ties within the four countries, but also uh, among the four countries together uh, as, as a Quad. Uh, but I think uh, there are, as such, uh, uh, I do not think there are any institutional uh, or um, uh, any uh, institutional mechanisms that the court can undertake in this regard, other than, of course, uh, beefing up their own uh, security apparatuses, improving maritime domain awareness. India is already, of course, doing a lot in this regard, uh, in, in increasing information sharing, uh, increasing the their um, uh, the existing security networks that are there in the Indian Ocean region and in the broader Indo-Pacific region as well, and of course uh, strengthening the countries that are there outside of the Quad, um, strengthening their own systems so that they can also uh, you know become reliable partners of the Quad grouping. Now you wanted to come in on this, Admiral. I wanted to come in on this aspect which you mentioned that you know how can uh, Quad implement uh, the various aspects. I would like to suggest that Quad uh, under the Indo-Pacific region, this whole thing is being considered at three levels. One is the concept of the free, open, inclusive Indo-Pacific, and that is the conceptual level of the entire uh, program or the structure. The political level is there by the Quad, and which has made tremendous progress and got great recognition being dealt with at the highest levels in the government. At the execution levels of the navies, which are going to be the main structure for implementation of these various measures, we need to have a cooperation arrangement between the navies of the Quad countries. Mm -hmm. Currently, this is being done under the umbrella of the Malabar, Malabar. series of exercises. I think it needs to have a proper structure where for cooperation between the navies of the Quad countries so that the various measures that are taken for implementation under the Quad structure in the maritime domain can actually be looked into. Now, Admiral, with advancement in technology, physical threats in the maritime region have now been overshadowed by technological threats. How does the Information Fusion Center for the Indian Ocean region in Gurugram, which was set up in 2018, assist in this regard. The Indian Navy has leveraged technology. I would say India has leveraged technology. And we launched the Naval Communication Satellite Rukmini way back in 2013. We then set up an extensive NC3I network, which is National Command Control Communication and Intelligence Network. And under this, we integrated the automatic identification system chains, the coastal radar stations, and 51 stations of the Navy and the Coast Guard. And these were integrated into the Information Management and Analysis Center at Gurgram, which was set up in 2014 when I had the privilege to be the chief. This was subsequently upgraded, as you rightly said, to the Fusion Center, uh, which is actually a collaboration for security and safety in the Indian Ocean region. Mm -hmm. India has also signed technical agreements with various navies as well as maritime nations to exchange white shipping information. And the purpose of all this is that we must have a clear picture of the maritime domain mm -hmm. awareness in our waters, whether it be a fishing boat, whether it be a ship, and this information is then exchanged with other neighboring maritime countries and other friendly countries so that we have a comprehensive maritime domain awareness. India has recently appointed its first National Maritime Security Coordinator, former Vice Admiral G. Ashok Kumar, 
Why was this step necessary and what challenges will this newly uh, set up body, uh, the NMSC, face? Well, uh, as you're aware that in the maritime domain, the vast spectrum of activities and initiatives are carried out by a host of ministries and agencies, both at the center and at the coastal state level. And there is a need to coordinate with all these agencies when we have to look at the holistic aspect of maritime security. And that is where this appointment of the National Maritime Security Coordinator comes in. And placing him under the NSA will make sure that the interministerial mm. interactions and coordinations are best achieved at the apex level. To understand the whole gamut of uh, what is behind this appointment, we also need to understand that under the leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister in recent years, there have been a large number of initiatives for development in the maritime domain, including the sustainable development and the quest to harness the blue economy. Mm -hmm. And the Honorable Prime Minister, as you mentioned yourself, has outlined his vision for security and growth for all in the region, for the Indian Ocean region. Some of the sectors in the maritime domain which are witnessing significant growth include that of port and harbors, where India has launched a very ambitious project of Sagarmala. We have 12 major ports and over 200 non-major ports. And Sagarmala is a port-led development initiative based on four pillars of port modernization, connectivity, port-led industrialization, and coastal community development. This also needs to be under the ambit of maritime security, including big data security. Mm. The second is our mercantile marine. 90% or 95% of India's trade by volume transit by sea. And we need to make sure that the sea lanes are open and there is no impediment to the free flow of oil or trade. Because if that happens, it will have a detrimental impact, not just on our economies, but the economies of the other countries in the region as well. We also have a vibrant shipbuilding industry. And here I'd like to make the mention of warship building, which I think is the finest example of Atmanirbharta and Swadeshi Karan, or self-reliance and indigenization. The Indian Navy has got transformed from a buyer's navy to a builder's navy. And I think it will make every Indian's heart very proud to learn that currently 40 ships and submarines are under construction in Indian shipyards ranging from aircraft carrier to frigates, destroyers, submarines, both nuclear as well as conventional. We need to take this initiative onto our commercial building sector and have a national shipbuilding plan. I mentioned about the thriving fishing industry. Now that poses a major security problem because we need to coordinate these issues not only at the center but with the coastal states in addition to the Navy and Coast Guard. The government has promulgated a very comprehensive island development plan, taking into account aspects of security, environment preservation, economic sustenance, sustenance of the cultural aspects. And these issues of these island security also needs to be taken into account. So when we put all these things into a basket, we can see that the mm. entry of the National Maritime Security Coordinator is going to be full and it have a challenge in coordinating the holistic maritime issues with these various agencies. Your final thoughts on maritime security and its importance for India? Well, I would only like to say that the seas around us are gaining newfound importance as each day goes by. And I personally have no doubt that the current century is the century of the seas. The initiatives that the government has taken recently in the maritime domain are all pointers to indicate that India has once again turned towards the seas and is destined to emerge as a resurgent maritime nation. India has vast maritime interests and the responsibility for protecting these assets falls squarely on the shoulders of men in white uniform because it is the responsibility of the Navy and the Coast Guard to ensure that these maritime interests, which have a vital relationship with the nation's economic growth, are allowed to develop unhindered both in peace and war. Thank you very much, Admiral Dhawan and Ms. Pratnashri Basu for these very, very valuable insights. In today's context, maritime security has indeed become the most dominant regional security issue of the 21st century, 
as the maritime domain becomes more complex, congested and contested. But India, as Admiral Dhawan has so well pointed out, is not only well prepared to tackle these threats, but also make its own contribution in keeping the oceans free, open and resilient to collective challenges. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Diplomatic Dispatch. Till we meet again, good night and goodbye.